Um, and so I think it's really important to understand that playful pedagogy is absolutely for teaching serious things. It actually makes teaching serious things easier. It makes it easier for students to approach those topics. So we're gonna hear from Casey Meehan now about that topic exactly. All right, um, so hold on, I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, is that up? We good? All right, cool. Yes. All right, fantastic. Um, holy cow, after this morning, um, if I can be a quarter of, uh, a quarter as insightful as, and inspiring as, as these last ones, I will be happy. Um, sort of like Liz, this is very much a presentation that's um, very much under construction. Um, the, the idea is under construction. Um, and I'm hoping that we can use uh, maybe 20 minutes, you know, of this really brief 20 minutes, we can use some of the, the time to just bounce some ideas around. I'd love to, to do some breakout rooms, um, or at least, you know, hopefully this will serve to advance our conversation a little bit um, on, on issues that lots of us have probably already been thinking about. Um, so um, I'm Casey Meehan. Um, I am the Director of Sustainability and Resilience at Western Technical College, which is in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, I'm also an associate lecturer in, at the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse um, in the business department, which is in itself funny because I have zero business background whatsoever. Nobody would ever want me working in a business, um, but yet I'm, I'm teaching there. So about sustainable principles in business. Um, my background is actually in education. I was a, a high school teacher for quite a while. Um, and then my advanced degrees are all in curriculum and instruction, um, looking at place-based education, but also climate change and sustainability education and, and how we go about doing that. Um, and one of the things that I actually like the best about what I do is I get to teach and talk to the community um, in our region a lot about climate change. And um, Lots of us here are likely responsible for helping students make sense um, of really disturbing and scary facts about life in 2020. And in doing so, I think um, what we might unintentionally be conveying, the messages we might unintentionally be conveying are really steeped in doom and gloom. Um, and at least within the climate communication literature, there exists zero conclusive body of empirical research that suggests that scaring the pants off of people actually motivates them to take action in any way, right? Um, in fact, it might be doing the opposite. And that's, that's a real problem because we need people to be taking actions on some of these, on some of these issues. And so the more I, I did climate presentations and talked about climate change and sustainability with folks, the more I started wondering about what a different path for teaching about climate change um, or any other difficult topic, what maybe a more playful path would feel like and what that would look like. Um, so play theorists talk about play as one of the universal ways that humans interact. Um, yet it's, it's really largely overlooked as a framework for engaging others in what we would call these serious discussions. So Mike, Mike uh, Rosen, Michael Rosen in his book, um, Oh gosh, I can't even think of the title of it. It's, it's Michael Rosen's book of play, I think. Um, he says that play is fundamental to our development as people and more broadly as a society and culture. And we also know that play, it's been brought up already this morning several times that you know, play has lots of numer um, em empirically tested benefits for learning and for mental health and for connecting each other um, or connecting us to each other and to the world that we live in. Um, there's also this element of bravery, right? So I, I do play stuff with my class and in, in, the, in the talks that I give about, about um, climate change, we, I do it playfully because I think that play, what we really need right now is to be brave, right? And play engenders bravery because when we're playing, we are vulnerable. And that's a really scary thing to do, to be vulnerable, especially as adults, right? Um, and so the more that we can practice playing and being vulnerable, the more that actually builds up bravery. And I would say that, you know, this, this idea of, of solid mental health and, and connecting to each other and bravery, those are the exact outcomes that we really need people to have in these troubling times. So I'm a, I'm a big advocate of play just for that. And what I want to be really clear about is that um, what this isn't is, is this is not about toxic positivity. Um, so toxic positivity is 
is this notion that you know you should only have a positive mindset about something and that negative emotions are bad or undesirable. I'm not saying with climate change, with COVID, with racism, that um, you know that that we need to take this Pollyannish perspective. Not at all. Like anxiety and grief are real emotions, um, and we really benefit by acknowledging them and by working through them. But once we've done that, well, where does it leave us, right? We need to recognize then that there's a much more holistic vision of the human experience that includes joy and delight. And that joy and delight can actually live side by side with grief and despair. Um, that's, that's part of being a, a whole human. So how might we take a more playful path in, in our teaching and learning about such fraught topics. Uh, and the good news, I think, is that um, we don't really need to create anything out of whole cloth. Um, Bernie DeCoven, who, uh, the late Bernie DeCoven is a playologist. Uh, if you haven't read any of, of his stuff, I can post a link in the chat later, later on. Um, he was a, um, big into the New Games Foundation and just a real uh, um, incredible play thinker. Um, and he, he likens um, like in taking a playful path to really walking down the same street that you normally do, right? So I, I like to think about this in my curriculum and my teaching. It's really, it's walking down the same, same street that I normally do. Taking a playful path just means that I'm walking down that street a little bit differently, right? I'm aware of things a little bit differently. I, my, my frame is just different. So maybe instead of walking, I'm skipping, or maybe I'm stepping on all the cracks, right? Or maybe I'm uh, doing the doing the, um, the hopscotch that the kids put out in, in, in chalk, right? Um, maybe I'm waving to squirrels or applauding when leaves fall. I don't know, it's, it's, I'm, it's the same street. I'm just paying attention to it a little bit differently. So I, I really liked um, Allison James's idea of the, the chocolate, right? Um, that that if, we, if we look at that just a little bit differently, there's all sorts of things that it can be, right? So lately I've been thinking about four elements that I think go into um, a more playful path when teaching about really difficult, um, maybe existential content. Um, and I'd like to share them with you. And again, this, is, this stuff is, is relatively new to me, right? And, and so just keep in mind that this is the start of a conversation, um, just sort of my ideas right now. So in his book about play, uh, Ian Bogus, who's a writer for The Atlantic, um, he's a game designer and he's also a professor at Georgia Tech. He discusses the idea of worldfulness. Um, and he defines worldfulness as a turning outward, remaining open to the infinity of things that are not our own feeble minds. In EduSpeak, um, you know, Bogus is really what I think he's talking about is inquiry learning, um, which a lot of us are familiar with. Another term for this, uh, for worldfulness might be wonder. And if you think about play, Play is often instigated with a derivation of the question, I wonder what would happen if, right? And so we can use that in our classrooms. I wonder what would happen if. Um, the picture you see here is actually from, I believe it's Richmond, Virginia, um, where they have a parking day once a year. And they pose the question, I wonder what would happen if we turned parking spots into something for humans, not, not cars, right? And you get all these playful ideas um, and really seeing the world and seeing that street that might be a common street, you see it in a different way. Uh, one way to pull our attention away from ourselves and again, to open us up to that worldfulness is surprise. And surprise is, is a word that I've heard tossed around a couple of, a couple of times here today already. Um, surprise destabilizes us just a little bit. Um, and that, when we're destabilized, it provides a space to introduce new perspectives. So one way surprise comes through in, in, in our curriculum, my curriculum, and, and I'm guessing lots of us, is humor, right? Um, I use humor all the time um, because it disarms us. And especially with climate change and when I'm talking to groups of diverse audiences, you know, I, I run into people who don't think climate change exists, right? So if I can use a little bit of humor to disarm them, um, it, it shifts them just a little, little bit, right? And I can, it actually puts people in a better mood, even if just for a couple of minutes. Um, and when people are in a better mood, there's, there's studies out there on positive affect that suggest that when you're in a better mood, you're less likely to stick with your initial hypothesis. You're more fluid and accepting of differences. Uh, in other words, you know, if we can laugh about something, then we're in a position to actually move forward constructively on it. 
Um, what you see here is a, a picture of a uh, my way of sort of surprising and using spontaneity um, in, in climate change, I've made a bunch of little um, bunch of little boats, sailboats, right, with old wine bottle corks. Um, don't ask me how many bottles of wine uh, you know had to come from all the sailboats that I've released or that I that I released. But there's a, a sail that I have on there, and it says I, you might not be able to read it, but it says uh, "Ahoy, mateys! Here there be global warming." That's my my really bad pirate voice. Um, and on the back, there's just some information with a question that um, that sort of engages people in climate change. And the idea is to release these sort of throughout town in, in places that are spontaneous, right? So if somebody walks around the corner and wow, they see something, they see that and they pick it up and they read it and it just engages them in a, in a different way. Um, in the sustainability world, we talk a lot about the concept of regeneration, um, which is regeneration is usually talked about, um, it's the drive towards life. And that drive towards life actually begets more life. Um, in other words, it's, it's the sense of renewal. And if you think about how you feel when you feel renewed, right? We, see, we feel um, a sense of delight and a sense of joy. Like it feels good to feel renewed. In fact, in her, in her book, Joyful um, by Ingrid Fetel Lee, um, she says that, that the drive towards joy is synonymous with the drive towards life and towards renewal, which I just think is a beautiful phrase. Um, so how do we make our teaching about difficult topics such that people actually feel a sense of regeneration and renewal in those topics? Um, and if we do that, you know, those we interact with will actually want to return for more. So oftentimes, you know, people might see me coming and they know, oh, here's the climate change guy and they run, right? But if I can give them a sense of renewal after discussions and after teaching and, and learning about climate change, then they'll want to return for more. They, they'll want to keep on engaging. Uh, we did this, I'm part of a group called the Upper Midwest Association of, Clim of Campus Sustainability. And we have a, a retreat every January. Um, and our last retreat, we actually organized it around the idea of play. Um, and so we got a bunch of sustainability professionals together um, and, uh, and basically played um, and, we, and we practiced playing just to become more playful. So we used, it was all a lot of open play. So boxes and balls and found faced objects and juggling and um, story cubes and things like that. Um, and yes, we, and playing outside together. Um, yes, we talked about climate change. We talked about difficult stuff, but the play actually ended up renewing us, right? It, it sent us home feeling much better. And then finally, um, this idea about of messing about um, in the 1960s and 70s, there was an uh, educational theorist team of Hawkins and Hawkins, and they used this term um, messing about to refer to a cycle in, in classrooms of exploring, uh, uh, exploring a material or an idea or a situation. And then uh, you, you explore that to bring familiarity and to make meaning and to maybe even raise further questions. So this might be what we consider play in a classroom, messing about. Um, and in the classroom, it, messing about really grants us the freedom to explore, right? Um, it's, it privileges process over outcome, and it really allows for failure. In fact, maybe it even encourages failure. Um, when you're messing about, you want to fail because that's how, you, that's how you learn things, right? So in a classroom, it might look like taking on different roles through simulations, um, imagining different rules, um, taking content and putting it together, it's, it's creativity, right? It's, it's having the freedom to, to, to put things together in different ways. So the, the question then is, how might we actually take a more playful path in our teaching about fraught topics? And what I would love to do, um, Lisa or David, I don't know if I have the ability to do this or not, um, but if we can just break, I know we've got about seven minutes or so, if we could break people into um, dis, in breakout rooms just for five minutes, um, and this is the question in the breakout room I'd like people to, um, to think about. So you can take my, the, the topic that I had, you can, you know, elaborate on those, or if you've got other ideas about how you actually bring playfulness into difficult topics, um, let's take that, the time limited as it is, let's take the time just to, to share. All right, great. So welcome, um, welcome back everyone. And, uh, here is, um, here's, I guess, where I want to leave you. Um, again, a, a quote from um, Bernie de Coven. 
Um, he writes, if we are going to make it safely and sanely through all the challenges coming our way, we're going to need to come out and play. And if we're going to come out and play, we are also going to have to take our need to play in the world more seriously. Not so seriously that we forget to have fun, but precisely so seriously that we remember. So thank you everyone for, for uh, joining the session. Um, I hope you had some great conversations. If you wanna continue the conversation, um, we can always do, I guess the, David will have the hallway opened up. Um, you can find me at these, these places. Um, and then I can also post uh, in the chat some of these sources, um, some of the different books and, and, and things that I've drawn from. That sound, sound good? That sounds great. Fantastic. Thank you, Casey. You bet. Thanks, everyone. That was awesome. Um, I think many of us teach serious topics, so that's so important. And just kind of that last quote that you shared is just life in general. I think it's a travesty that we think play is for kids. And when you get to adulthood, it's unprofessional or a waste of time. So I really enjoyed that. Thank you. You bet. All right. All right. So coming up next is the fun club. But let's see here. Um, we've got a few minutes until it starts. And if I do this right, let's see here. There we go. The fun club. Yay. So the schedule for the fun club is back on the website where you can all find it. 